Welcome. You are listening to the Upper Room Podcast. For more information or to donate to this ministry, visit URFellowship.com. Good morning. It's so great to be here. I'm Chris, if we haven't met each other. I really am honored that I get to talk up here every week. Uh, it's really a privilege. I feel like I want to say that every week. And I want to say this every week, but um, I want to just let you know, I'm learning all this stuff too, right? It's as much for me as anybody else. I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. So, so you preach what you need to hear sometimes. Um, so we're in a series called Love. I'm sorry, Love is blank. And in this series, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 13. It's the most famous words ever written about love. Paul begins 1 Corinthians 13 by saying that everything minus love is nothing. He says, though I speak in the tongues of men and angels, I could have all knowledge and faith and move mountains, give everything away, but if I don't have have love, I'm nothing. The single purpose of your life is to become a more loving person. And the purpose of our church is to be a community of love. We need to make love our number one commitment. Because that's why we're here. So today we're going to start looking at some of the different aspects of love that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. Today we're going to look at patience. Uh, Let's go ahead and read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Dallas Willard, who was a, he was a Christian philosopher and author, super smart guy, just a student of the scriptures and of Jesus, was once asked a question. <clears throat> if you had one word to describe Jesus, what would it be? What would be that word? It's a really interesting question, right? We might say Lord, we might say King or Healer. In, in this case, there was a long pause, and this is the word he chose to describe Jesus. He said, relaxed. Jesus is relaxed. And I heard, I heard about that answer, and I thought, that is not, <clears throat> that's not the word I would have put on the top of my list. Right? It's not in any of the creeds. I believe in Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was relaxed. Right? It sounds way too just kind of, kind of undignified. It doesn't sound religious enough, but I think that's the point, because it caused me to kind of think of Jesus' life from a different lens. Jesus arrived on earth in very special circumstances. From, from the age of 12, he, he said, I must be about my father's business. He had a weight, of, a weight on his shoulders like nobody else in history, right? The situation in Israel and with all of humanity was dire, yet he worked as a carpenter in obscurity in a little shop in a backwoods town of Nazareth year after year. He turns 18, 20, 25, 29, and still, he's hammering nails and selling boards. Jesus, the clock is ticking. Yep, it'll happen. I won't worry about it. And finally, he starts his ministry. John the Baptist gives him this big launch. There's these big crowds. Everybody wants to hear from him. His first step is to go off the grid for 40 days into a desert somewhere to be alone with God in unhurried prayer. When he finally gets around to his ministry... His first sermon in, in his hometown is so radically inclusive of outsiders that the listeners want to kill him. Luke 4 actually tells us that he tried to throw him off a cliff. So this would have made me a little nervous, right? You know, right? Rarely after church, Kate asks, how did you think the sermon went? And I have to say, well, they wanted to kill me. But I gave him the slip, so that's a win. But Luke says Jesus just passed through the midst of the crowd. He just kind of saunters down the street like a guy without a care in the world. He always traveled at the speed of foot. He he and his disciples were one time walking through Samaria. He tells them, you go ahead and find food. I'm kind of tired. I'm going to hang out here by the well. Just want to get a little rest. They they, They get back and he's talking to a Samaritan Gentile woman. No rabbi would go anywhere near this woman. He's talking to her just as relaxed as can be. They were in a boat one time and some storms came in. And the storms were so bad the disciples were totally freaking out. Right? They were fishermen. And they were afraid they were going to die. They're used to boats. They're used to storms. Jesus is taking a nap. 
The next time your spouse gives you a hard time for taking a nap, just say, I'm just trying to be more like Jesus, honey. <laughs> and at one point, his teachings are so challenging that followers kind of start dropping out. The crowd starts slimming down. The disciples go, Jesus, we have to go to Jerusalem. We have to do something. We have to get this momentum back. And he says, no, it's not, it's not my time yet. One time he's, he's taking a whip to the, to the money changers in the temple. It's kind of a famous story. We're told in one of the Gospels that Jesus takes time to braid the whip himself, which is cool. Jesus, what are you doing? Braiding a whip. Couldn't you get one pre-braided, right? Couldn't you just miracle one up? Nope, I'd rather braid it myself. They're not going anywhere. We see how patient and relaxed he was, maybe most with his relationship with his, with his disciples. They were a very slow group. group. Right? They were slow to understand what he taught, slow to understand who he was, slow to obey, slow to trust. They misunderstood him, doubted him, denied him, abandoned him. Jesus diagnoses their condition at the very end of Luke. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe. Now, I'll guarantee you, if you were the leader of an urgent movement and you're on the clock, the last quality you want in your team is slowness. Yet Jesus picked these guys. And he was demanding of them, but never demeaning. He never said, I'm going to swap you out. Because he was teaching us about love. And the very first characteristic of love Paul describes is love is patient. Relaxed is a great word to describe Jesus. Because it gets us out of kind of this religious category. Sometimes we hear the word patience. And we think of like teeth gritting endurance. Right? Oh, geez, give me the patience to put up with this bozo. Help me suppress my rage, right? That's patience. Jesus was not a teeth gritter. He was not uptight, stressed out, ill-tempered, or at the end of his rope. And this was well known among his disciples. They never said to each other, watch out for Jesus today. It looks like he got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. He was the most relaxed person they had ever seen. Not because he lived in pleasant, easy circumstances, but actually he lived in the complete opposite circumstances. And I think we have a little bit of a screwed up idea of patience. Maybe that patience means wimpy, or patience means not really devoted to the mission. But patience in the Bible does not mean passive or lacking urgency or or failing to hold people accountable. Patience is the ability to dwell gladly in the present moment when we would prefer not to. It's often translated long-suffering. Because it means love has the ability to suffer difficulty for a long time and not stop loving. Long-suffering. And here's the thing, patience has always been hard for human beings, but in my opinion, it's harder to be patient now than it was in Jesus' day because of the nature of the world we live in. With technology and the pace of life accelerating, right, people have always had food. It was in our day that we invented fast food. For the first time, we, we would get food not because of how good it was or even how cheaply we could get it, but just because it was fast. And that wasn't even good enough because we had to go and, you know, order in a fast food restaurant, sit down and eat at a table and eat it. So we invented the drive through so families could eat in the vans as God intended. Now, one lane isn't fast enough now, so they give you two lanes from which you can order. Right? It only takes from, from freezer to hot in your hand 2.3 minutes. How do we speed that up? Double lanes. Which gives the added bonus of a little competition, right? So that you can try to order before that guy over there in that lane. So that you can beat him to the window. That might just be me. We, we invented not just dating, but speed dating, self-checkout, overnight shipping, instant messaging. We text, but it takes too long to spell the darn words on the phone, so we abbreviate so we can get on to the next thing at ASAP. We look at screens until we're exhausted. I'm not making this up. When asked about competition, the CEO of Netflix shrugged his shoulders and said that their biggest competition was sleep. That's what they're after. Make people stop wasting so much time sleeping so that they can look at more streaming things on their screens. How many of you this week, this is a safe place, if you're a guest, this is a safe place, welcome home. How many of you this week have been downloading a document, a picture, something, and then gave up because it wasn't moving fast enough? Think how crazy that is. Oh man, I've been waiting for like 14 seconds, never mind. What kind of Wi-Fi does this place have, right? I have no time for this. We're perpetually impatient now. It's just in the very last 10 years of human existence that we've been able to be at a dinner with friends and go, hey, who was that third baseman for the Dodgers in the 90s? And actually get an answer to that. 
Before the internet and the cell phone, you just had to hope that one day you remembered. Or that you came across someone who knew the answer. Or God forbid, to go to the library to find the answer in a book. You couldn't just pull out your phone and in a matter of seconds find the answer, right? That's brand new. It's never existed before in the history of mankind. Yet we're perpetually aggravated. How many of you have yelled at a device in the last month? Has anybody yelled at their screen? That's crazy, right? But it's common. In 1879, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Now it didn't have to get dark, so we don't have to go to bed when it gets dark anymore. True story. Before Edison, Edison's light bulb was invented, Americans slept on average 11 hours a night. You might read about John Wesley getting up at 4 in the morning to pray, right? In our day, we read about people like that, and we're, what spiritual giants they must have been. We forget they went to bed at 6 p.m. They had nothing else to do. Think how much nicer you would be if you slept 11 hours a night. Dallas Willard also said, one of the things you do when you become a disciple of Jesus is you begin to do those things you always have known you should be doing. So this is important because we have to not feel pressured to be conformed to this world. Because the world is very impatient. And I'm sure to most people, impatience looks like a trivial little thing. But it will kill my prayer life. Impatience will mess up my relationship with my kids. Impatience will make me live a shallow life. Because it will make me go, I don't want to finish that assignment. I don't want to stick to this diet. I don't want to stay in this marriage. I don't want to honor my commitment. I don't want to stay on this budget. I, think, I, you know, I, I don't want to obey God in my sexual behavior because I want what I want when I want it. Love is patient and long-suffering. The Lord values patience in his children. Love, agape love, is patient. We talked about agape love last week. What's the connection between agape love and patience? I don't think we normally make that connection. We think it's kind of patience is one thing and love is another. But Paul here in 1 Corinthians is saying love is patient, agape love. What's the connection there? To get, at, to get at it, let's ask this question. Think of the last time you were impatient. Maybe it was fairly recently. Maybe this was a while ago. But put that in your mind. Get a picture of that in your mind. The person that you were impatient with. And now ask the question, what was going on in your mind when you were impatient with them? In all look, likelihood, what was not going on in your mind is your mind saying, this person has unsurpassable worth. Lord, bless them. Lord God, you died for them. Thank you for their unsurpassable worth. What was more likely going on in your mind, mind, if you'll examine it and get introspective about it, it was something like this. This person is not fitting into my plan. Correct? Think about it. This person is not fitting my agenda. A little while ago, I was late for a meeting, and I got behind uh, an older lady in her car, who had, had unsurpassable worth, but I was in a hurry. And usually I'm pretty patient in the car, but this person was driving just so very carefully. Uh, the kind of person that you know, three blocks ahead of time, she's slowing down for the green light just in case it turns yellow. Don't do that. Yellow means maybe you can make it, all right? <laughs> just kidding. And then she would come to a stop sign and look several times both ways, and if, there's a, if there was a car like four blocks down, she didn't go through the intersection, just in case that person happened to be blind and might run into them as their car stalls. It's like, no, no, come on, I'm in a hurry. See, I've got an agenda, and you're not fitting into my agenda. I want to get there on time. And you're supposed to know that about me. And it couldn't get, you can't get past her, you can't get around her, so you're stuck there. That's impatience. You see, impatience is always about... Notice this. It's always about putting ourselves in the center. Things revolve around us. We have an agenda and want people and things and circumstances to fit into our agenda. And when they don't, we get frustrated. And that's called impatience. We we impose a supposed to on people. You're supposed to drive faster. You're supposed to go through the yellow light. 
You know, you're supposed to be able to tie your shoes when you're seven years old. You're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to know what I mean. You're supposed to be able to read better than that. You're supposed to be be more mature than this after you've been a Christian for three years. What's wrong with you? You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. And when people don't meet our supposed tos, that's impatience. It's about me. Do it my way. Do it at my speed. Do it how I think you should. Do it when I want it. But when that doesn't happen, the gulf between our agenda and reality is impatience. It's imposing our standard. The standard, by the way, is always self-serving. It's always meant to favor us. You know this is true because we don't have trouble being patient with people in areas that we need patience on, do we? We're full of understanding then. If when we have things that we're good at and another person's, you know, struggling in, that's when we find it hard to be patient. My daughter inherited my gene for losing things. My daughter, God bless her, she can lose anything. She loses her homework all the time. She has lost her shoes, right? She'll leave the house in the morning with shoes on, come back with no shoes. It's a mystery. And I think Katie, my wife, who tends to be organized, sometimes she has trouble understanding what's so hard about remembering to bring your homework home or your shoes. But I'm full of compassion. Honey, I understand things disappear right from under your nose. I know what it's like. I have an easy time being patient with people who lose things because I need the patience shown to me. But you take an area that I don't care much about or an area that I'm good at and you're struggling with and now I've got no patience. Shopping, for example. I don't get shopping. I don't understand it. It's not part of my world. The purpose for shopping is to go in, get what you came for and get out as fast as possible. Amen? All right, men. Ah. I don't know if it's a guy thing, but the minute I step into a store, I get tired. Right? I mean, profoundly tired. It's like, ugh, the fatigue. It's easy for us to be patient in areas that we need ourselves. We ourselves need patience in. But in areas that we got locked down, that's when impatience rears up. That's why usually Christians tend not to judge other people in sins that they themselves are guilty of or have struggled with. But it's in areas that, they've, that we've conquered that we've become judgmental and impatient. Right? What's wrong with you? You know, Here you are five years later being a Christian, still struggling with that? That took me two days. What's the problem here? We always judge out of our success. And we always impose our supposed to's out of our success. And when we do that, it's not love because we're not ascribing unsurpassable worth. Usually we're diminishing that person's worth. Impatience almost always results in some degree in devaluing people. What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? You can't read fast enough? You're not mature enough? You're not trying hard enough? It's damaging. And it isn't fair because people are profoundly different. We grow in different ways. We struggle with different things. We're good at different things. We learn at different paces. We're just very different. And patience is a matter of giving people space to be unlike you. Agape love is patient because it describes the worth of someone to someone who's very, very different than you are. It is showing a love that's not based on their merit. But when we're living in the center, it's very hard for us to do that. We want to universalize our supposed to's and impose them on other people, and that creates impatience. Okay, so two fundamental questions. Question one, and this is designed to try to kind of break the addiction to imposing our supposed to's on people. Number one, who made us judge of supposed to's? Who made us the supposed to police? Think about it. That is a result of putting ourselves in the center and making it about us. In truth, our job, the central job of our life, is simply to give away what we have received. We replicate the love God has toward us, toward other people. To love and ascribe unsurpassable worth to people. That's our central job. 
He hasn't called us to be the judge of supposed tos. And let me qualify that a little bit. There are times when you're the boss and it's your job to be the supposed to person, right? And hold people accountable. That's an employment situation. I'm not talking about that. There can also be times where it's dysfunctional to be too patient. If I can put it this way. There are times where love has to confront and love has to draw a line in the sand when it's in the interest of the other person to do that. And there are cases like that. For example, if you're dealing with a a rageaholic or an abusive person or an alcoholic, you can't just keep cutting them slack and giving them more rope to hang themselves. That's not the loving thing to do. And so sometimes out of love and wisdom, there will be times to confront the person and draw the line in the sand and say, here are the consequences if if this doesn't stop. Love sometimes does that. But the difference is this. That's a godly thing because that's not inconsistent with love. That's what they need. But most of the time when we are impatient, it has nothing to do with that. It's not about the other person. It's usually thinking about yourself. This is my agenda, my needs, my plans, and you're not fitting into them. Secondly, here's a powerful question. Has not God been infinitely patient with each of us? You know, God is the one who can impose supposed tos. He's allowed. Yet God is patient with us. I bet, I bet there are areas of your life that God is patient with you on. Even now, I don't care how far along you are in your Christian walk. I bet they're, they're, you're not perfect, and God is patient with you about that. He works from the inside. He's always growing us. But he does it very patiently. Like I said, the essential job of life is simply to give away what you have received. You give away the love that you have received. You give away the patience that you have received. As he is patient with you, you extend patience. Paul says this in Romans 2. He says, you, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, when you impose your supposed twos on on somebody. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. You show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience. When we don't give what we have received, we're really despising the thing that we have received. So how do we move into love in this area? It really happens when we die to ourselves as judge and center. As long as you're living in the center and you think the world revolves around you, You'll always be imposing your supposed tos. We need to, as Paul said, crucify ourselves daily. Die to the idea that you are the center. Which means, number two, live to God as the center. Make him the center of your life, the source of your life, the source of your significance. So that all your needs are met by your relationship with Jesus Christ. You orbit him, he doesn't orbit you. And out of that then comes the third thing. Now you're in a position where you can begin to live in love. What does love require of you? Love requires that we be patient. In the moments that are left, I want to give you a couple practices to grow your patience this week for the purposes of love. The first practice is just slow down. Maybe just this week, drive the speed limit joyfully. If the sign says 35 miles per hour, go 35 miles per hour. And do it with a smile, kind of enjoying with God the silliness of our preoccupation with hurry. Maybe just this week when you come to a stop sign, stop. Like all the way. Let the tires quit rolling. And ask God to give you patience. It's amazing the power of impatience. Two weeks ago there was a Milwaukee mom who was teaching her son to drive and something happened and someone got impatient and shot and killed the mom in front of her 17-year-old son. You see, I mean, road rage everywhere. You might be thinking, I haven't shot anybody in the car this week, so I'm doing pretty good. Our goal is not to avoid shooting people. It's love. This week when you're driving, instead of treating other drivers as enemies, ask, is there anything, anyone on the road I can show kindness to in some way? Proverbs 19.11 says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It's, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. I drive a lot, so most of the time, not all the time, 
But most of the time in traffic, I try to literally treat it as forgiveness practice. Jesus said you'll be forgiven as you forgive. So I have a chance now to forgive that guy who cut me off. Or that older lady who can't seem to find the accelerator. When you're at a stoplight and there's a car in front of you and the light turns green and there's no movement, just quote Jesus' words. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. (laughs) Maybe just this week, deliberately drive in a slow lane. You'll get to wherever you're going three minutes later. Today, when you leave this room after the service, walk slowly. Do not start planning your escape route now. I was thinking about this. What if when somebody visited our church or asked someone about our church, what's that place like? The first thing they said and the first thing people noticed was, people were just so relaxed. There was a peaceful feeling. They weren't all rushed. They had time to look you right in the eye and talk to you. It just felt human. Another practice is noticing people. Love is patient because only patient people really notice other people. Right? You can't love people if you don't really notice them. I wrestle with this all the time. Because here's what I'm realizing. Hurry and always being busy is a really close relative to ego. Jesus noticed a tax collector up in a tree named Zacchaeus. Jesus Jesus noticed a man born blind from birth who other people didn't look at or recognize. A woman who touched the hem of his garment and a big crowd full of people, he noticed it. Little children, his disciples knew Jesus would have no time for them, except he did. Jesus was the great noticer of humanity. Why? Well, relaxed people look. Impatient, hurried people overlook. Make this kind of a game. Jesus, help me to look at people in my life today and not just look past them. Are they sad? Are they scared? Are they celebrating something good? Notice. Love is patient. To not love is the opposite. To not love is short-tempered, hot-tempered. Love is long-suffering. It can suffer and not quit loving. In every moment, love is patient. When I surrender myself to God as the center of my life and I give to other people what I receive from Him, I am living in the reality of the kingdom of God. And I know, it's, I know it's cliche, but it needs said once in a while. We only, we only get one ride on this big merry-go-round, right? You only get one life. And it can be filled with goodness and curiosity and wonder, or it can be rushed through and thrown away stupidly. Nobody knows how long the one I have is or will last, So every moment's a gift. Why do we rush past them? This is is the pearl of great price, the life in the kingdom together with God. This life of love and joy and gratitude and pain and hope all mingled together. I charge you today, don't miss it. Notice and care because love is patient. Your life is about love. Love.